Hi everyone! So I want to start out by saying that I respect Melanie Joy. I've read a few of her books, I even met her in college. She wouldn't remember me, but here's photo evidence. I gotta say though, I was disappointed with her recent interview with Humane Hancock. I encourage you all to watch Michelle Lowe's response as she is a professional psychologist. I also highly recommend reading Casey Taft's book, Motivational Methods for Vegan Advocacy, a clinical psychologist's perspective. I am not a professional psychologist, but I find Michelle and Casey's arguments more compelling than Melanie's. I would love to see them debate. Very often, vegans have this idea, um, this belief, which is completely understandable, um, that you're either vegan and you're part of the solution or you're not vegan and you're part of the problem. It's a totally understandable belief for mm -hmm. many obvious reasons, probably. Um, and nevertheless, that is also, I believe, an inaccurate belief. And that can, you know, cost us supporters that we really need. So rather, many, many people, for many reasons, are neither able in their own minds or, or willing to actually become fully vegan. And if we do not invite those people to use their influence in whatever way they can to support a cause that really needs all the help it can get, then we are not advocating for this cause in the most effective way possible. So I, I always recommend that we ask others not to quote unquote go vegan, but to become what I call a vegan ally. A vegan ally is a supporter of veganism even though they're not yet fully vegan themselves. And so in my own experience, um, having been in this movement for I think three decades now, I'm dating myself, but um, I have seen over and over again that some of the people who actually do the most good in terms of number of animals spared, for example, or impact mm -hmm. they have, they're not vegan and they're not even vegetarian. They're, for example, journalists, you know, who reach out to me and other people, they'll do like articles on carnism that reach millions, sometimes, you know, hundreds of thousands mm. of people. Some of the people who donate to my organization beyond carnism, which is a hundred percent dependent on, on donations are not vegan, but they really believe in the cause and they want to help us create a more vegan world. Um, People are, you know, most people, most people are find animal agriculture offensive once they really make the question. If we give them the opportunity to participate in the transformation, then we invite people in to use their influence in a whole variety of ways. Um, and I think this is really important. Oh boy, there's a lot to unpack here. First of all, if you have control over your own decisions and you choose to support a cruel and violent industry when other options are available, you are part of the problem. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at a cause if your actions undermine it. It's like an abusive partner attempting to pacify you by buying you nice shit. Expensive gifts don't atone for abuse. The first and most important step for atonement is to stop the abuse. Second, people who are not able to go vegan in their mind or unwilling to go vegan are lacking information and motivation. Unless you live in a remote village and rely on animal flesh for your survival, you have the ability to choose vegan options. If you believe you're unable to go vegan for health reasons, you're misinformed about nutrition. Meat is not a macronutrient, it's not a food group. It contains no special properties or essential nutrients that cannot be obtained from non-animal sources. I once believed that I could never be a vegetarian. Most vegans once believed this. Clearly, we were wrong. The answer is to educate people, not to validate their excuses. Third, the concept of a vegan ally is nonsensical. It frames the issue around vegans. The vegan movement is not about vegans, it's about the animals. Vegans are allies to the animals. To be a true ally to the animals, you have to stop participating in their oppression. If you're not vegan, your allyship is performative. Lastly, I understand that simply providing people with information is not going to turn them vegan instantly. There are a lot of cognitive barriers, and it takes time to knock them all down. But watering down the message only slows down this process. People become self-satisfied as a reducitarian if they're praised by vegans for doing their part. If I'm told that I'm doing the most good for the animals by publishing an article about veganism, what motivation is there for me to change my behavior? I'm already a part of the solution. And a, a part of being a vegan ally um, is to really be as vegan as possible. And so I also encourage people to really think of carnism and veganism on a spectrum. 
And mm -hmm. where you're at on this spectrum is in some ways less important, some ways than, than where you're heading. And to really encourage people to be as vegan as possible. First of all, this is the only rational ask because nobody can be more <laughs> vegan than what's possible for them. Now, a lot of vegans get stuck on this because mm. we all have learned to believe that we're actually mind readers when we're not. I know what's possible for you. We all believe that we know what is possible for other people because mm -hmm. of our observations. But what's possible for somebody else is what they believe is possible for them. I discussed this in my video on Peter Singer, which was a bit controversial, but I don't entirely disagree that there is a spectrum. There are gray areas, so therefore the qualifier as far as possible and practicable is somewhat open to interpretation. But the phrase as vegan as possible is redundant because to be vegan is to avoid animal products as far as possible and practicable. So it's interesting that she isn't just calling these people vegan. If they're as vegan as possible, then they're vegan, right? To claim that what's possible for someone else is what they believe is possible for them is proven incorrect by the millions of vegans who once believed they could never be vegan. It was clearly possible for them. They were wrong. <laughs> This applies in so many other areas. A lot of yogis thought handstanding was impossible until one day they did it. To quote Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. What help would a yoga instructor be if they validated their students' beliefs that handstanding is impossible? So I'll give you an example. Um, I had somebody once say to me, um, Melanie, you should be a fraternian. And they like made a pretty strong case for why I should be fruitarian. And I was like, well, you know, I, you know, I, I, what about the winter? I was living in Boston at the time. It's cold in the winter. Like, oh no, 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 don't worry. Like you're fine. You can, you can eat this, this, and this, you can warm your food up. Just don't cook it. Um, it was these fruits I was talking about. Well, you know, I travel a lot. Oh, if you plan in advance, you can be fine. Travels. Well, I, I like going out to dinner. Oh, there are plenty of places are accommodating. I totally sounded like a non-vegan, right? And I'm all defensive. I'm all like coming up with, and then I just said, I just can't do it. It's not possible. They said, Melanie, it is possible. You live across the street from Whole Foods. It's possible. And I, that was really interesting for me because this is exactly the way that we approach non-vegans. It's not possible for somebody if it feels like it's not sustainable for them. Um, and so when we ask people to be as vegan as possible, we're letting them be experts on their own experience. We're reducing defensiveness. Um, mm -hmm. so what are people going to say? No, I'm not going to be as vegan as possible. Like, well, then you're already being as vegan as possible. Um, and frankly, if everyone in the world were as vegan as possible, the world would become vegan fairly quickly. This is disanalogous for several reasons. One, fruitarianism is a diet. Veganism is a social justice movement. One has a strong ethical basis, the other does not. Also, fruitarianism is stupid. It is overly restrictive, and there's no scientific basis for avoiding whole grains, beans, and other starches. Veganism, on the other hand, is rational and backed by science. And lastly, it's a misconception that veganism is restrictive. Sure, in the technical sense, you could say it's restrictive, but it's a lot less restrictive than fruitarianism. It prohibits only certain foods, not entire food groups. There is a vegan version of almost every animal product we consume. So when people claim that a vegan diet is too restrictive, they need to be shown that it's not. And this reminds me of uh, a poll by the Sentience Institute uh, where they, f they looked at US adults and found that uh, around 49% of the US public supported a ban on factory farming uh, and 47% supported a ban on slaughterhouses. You know, you would never imagine that there was this much support for institutional change simply by looking at the number of vegans in the US. But there is. Um, and, I, and I guess to kind of emphasize what you're saying, uh, it seems like a terrible missed opportunity to try and to not to take advantage of that public support for animal rights because these people aren't vegan. And that's very, very well put. Um, very well put. I've actually discussed with my local activist friends about working on a ballot initiative to ban factory farming in Colorado. I'll let you know how that goes. I'm not sure what he means by a missed opportunity. It's important to promote both systemic and individual change. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. As for taking advantage of people's support for animal rights, he's conflating rights with welfare. A ban on factory farming is not a ban on animal exploitation. 
Most people support animal welfare, not animal rights. And by support, I mean they pay lip service. To get people to actually support animal rights, we need to shift the Overton window. We do so by establishing veganism as the moral baseline and asking for nothing less. Compromising up front is a terrible negotiation strategy. And I think it's also important just to acknowledge that vegans who believe this, that you know, if you're not vegan, you're part of the problem, it makes mm. rational sense that they would believe that. You know, we are living in the midst of a global atrocity. Uh, atro yeah atrocity. <laughs> Carnism is a global atrocity. And, you know, when you're awake to this reality, many people who, you know, have open eyes and are like moving through this world aware of the tremendous suffering that's happening every moment of every day, mm. you, you cannot not be affected by that. Nobody gets through this unscathed in some ways. And many people feel, you know, vegans feel this very strong conviction and moral outrage. And I want to end this atrocity as quickly as possible mm. and are also developing trauma, you know, post-traumatic responses to that. And, and when you're traumatized, as many vegans are completely understandably, because an atrocity is by definition, it's a mass traumatic event. And when you are a part of this, you know, by simply by being awake to it and aware of it, um, it really affects your psyche. It really affects the way that you view the world. You start to view the world in uh, through what I call a trauma narrative in this. You know, you start to see people as either victim, perpetrator or hero, and you really lose your capacity for nuance. We start to put everyone, mm. including ourselves, into one of these three categories. Um, we hold ourselves and others to impossible standards. So it becomes increasingly difficult to recognize that somebody can be a perpetrator, AKA eating animals and a hero, AKA part of the solution at the same time. And we have this kind of like, you know, very fundamentalist all or nothing thinking, I would call mm -hmm. it traumatic thinking, you know, it, it's, this is really entrenched in the movement right now. So it makes a lot of sense why people believe you have to be vegan to be a part of the solution and and it's very important that we have conversations like this one so that we, you know, hopefully start healing some of this rigid thinking for vegans themselves and so that vegans can advocate more effectively. Okay, I understand that the world is complex and we can't classify people as either a hero, victim, or perpetrator. You can be both a victim of oppression and an oppressor. You can be helping a cause in one moment while hurting it in another. The issue I have here is that she's conflating sticking to clear principles with black and white thinking. She's implying that those who disagree with her strategy are fundamentalists who have lost their capacity to understand nuance because of trauma or whatever. You can recognize nuance and still promote veganism rather than reducitarianism. So to give an example of the, the black and white framing we see, um, some animal, animal right, grassroots animal rights, rights organizations uh, encourage activists who are outreaching the public to say things like um, you're either vegan or you're an animal abuser. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are sp like specifically on, on this kind of messaging during outreach conversations. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, there's the this uh, therapist, uh, psychotherapist Terence Real, who writes relationship books, and, and he says, you know, you have a choice. He's talking to, about working with married couples. He says to the married couples, you have a choice. Um, you can be married or you can be right. You decide what you want to be. <laughs> um, and I would say this to vegans, you know, you can be accurate in the language that you use. And in this case, even abuse is not accurate, right? I mean, you could say it is, but by definition under the law, you know, um, or you can be, or you can be effective. You know, we want to use words like mortar and corpse when we're talking about eating animals. We want to use like all sorts of terminology. Many vegans feel like they have to be, you know, exposing carnism and not colluding with the system by not using euphemisms, for example, mm -hmm. um, just doesn't work. Um, and typically it doesn't work and it turns people off. Hold on a second. She coined the term carnism and runs an organization called Beyond Carnism, yet she's playing a carnist semantics game. Abuse is not accurate, legally speaking. The whole point is to change public perception so that dictionary definitions and legal definitions reflect reality. 
Language is both descriptive and prescriptive. Vegans are being prescriptive with the use of the word murder. We understand that the dictionary definition does not include animal slaughter, but we're arguing that it should. But with words like abuse, we're being descriptive. The dictionary definition already includes animals. What we do to animals is cruel and violent, and non-human animals are not different from us in any relevant way that would justify such treatment. I would argue that the qualifier or animal should be dropped from the definition of abuse, and the definition of person should be expanded to include most other animals. Anyway, what evidence does she have that using accurate terminology doesn't work? People say this as if it's an unquestionable fact. She says it turns people off. But as Michelle Lowe explains, research on persuasion shows that there is often a delayed response, known as the sleeper effect. This effect has been observed in various situations including the delayed acceptance of an ego-attacking message and the delayed impact of minority influence. They may discount the message initially, but it sticks with them in the back of their mind until one day it clicks. You know, research has shown that when people feel that their dignity is harmed or that there's even a threat to harm their dignity, your dignity is your sense of self-worth. Your dignity is your feeling of, you know, that you are a fundamentally worthy being on this planet, that you have, when you feel your sense of dignity, you feel that you have just as much right as anybody else to be treated with respect. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about dignity later. It's, it's central absolutely central to all of the work that we do at Beyond Carnism, and not the least of which is um, through our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, where we train vegan advocates how to communicate more effectively. When you communicate in a way that harms somebody's dignity, when you communicate in a way that shames them, that basically communicates that they are somehow less than, less worthy of being treated with respect, um, you increase the chances that they are going to have a defensive reaction, a defensive reaction, meaning that they will go into a state of hyper arousal. It could be minor, it could be major. So this is a state of you know, fight or flight, basically. Mm -hmm. um, everybody knows what I'm talking about because everybody's been defensive. you know. Yep. And when a person is in this more defensive state, um, they lose their capacity for, not entirely, but they have a reduced capacity for rational thinking and they are less likely to be able to stay connected with their empathy. So you basically, when you shame somebody, you are engaging in the very, you are increasing the chances that they will be resistant to your message. And you're demonstrating to onlookers that you're not a safe person to, mm -hmm. if you, we want people to be open to our message, we need to create an environment where people will feel safe enough to allow themselves to be open to actually hearing about how they are acting in a way that's violating their own integrity and participating in an atrocity. That in and of itself is a hard ask, even when you're creating a safe environment. Absolutely. I agree in the general sense, but she isn't differentiating between toxic shame and healthy shame. I think there's a tactical difference between saying you're either a vegan or an animal abuser and by purchasing animal products, you're supporting animal abuse. With the former, you're assigning a negative label to the person. With the latter, you're assigning a negative label to their actions. I agree that we shouldn't go around calling people murderers or animal abusers, but I strongly disagree that we shouldn't use words like murder or corpse. Corpse? If telling someone the truth evokes feelings of shame, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. I don't like that vegans are made to feel that we're in the wrong if others react defensively. I think this excessive self-blame can lead to burnout. Of course we should be self-reflective, but a defensive reaction isn't always an indictment of our communication skills. Again, the sleeper effect is very relevant here. It seems counterintuitive, but a defensive reaction could actually be evidence of effective persuasion. I'll let Michelle explain. So the sleeper effect is, right, if you're um, be if if we're all persuaded by things, right? So advertisers want us to buy their product, so they're gonna buy advertising space. It's big, big business. Whether it's Google ads, whether it's billboards, whether it's TV ads, big, big, big business, right? So they know that. There is evidence, there is lots and lots of research that this kind of persuasion through advertising absolutely works. 
But when I see an advert for washing powder, right, I don't instantly jump up and think washing powder unless I'm in the market for washing powder. So advertisers advertise knowing that they're not going to get an instant response. But what it's doing, it's putting the idea in someone's mind. And if you see that advert again and again and again, that's why adverts are repeated again and again and again, right? It goes into your brain and it it fires off when I when you go to a supermarket, right? You almost subconsciously are going to lean towards something that you've seen, something that you're familiar with. So in the most simple terms, we could argue that's the sleeper effect, that, you know, you, it's soaked into your brain. And then at a later date, when there's a trigger, like you are inspired or you need a particular product, you're going to remember the one that you've seen on a Google ad, and you won't remember it, right? But it's almost subconscious. But there's a little bit more to it than that, because... Sometimes people will, will disregard an argument, right? And this is where the sleep effect's really important with, in, in veganism. That if a vegan activist is, um, is talking to somebody, talking to a non-vegan and putting arguments forward, that person, right, might initially discount that information, Right, because they don't want to listen. They're not they're not ready yet. They're not ready to listen. Or they might say, Oh, well, that person was very rude. That person was Joey Carbstrong, and you know, he's like blunt and a bit, you know, comes off as a little bit aggressive. But further down the line, when that person is actually more, more ready, they might come upon veganism, or they might hear something about veganism on the telly or the friend might talk about it and that information that originally was put into your head by that activist basically fires off again it's like you discounted it at the time but you haven't forgotten it we never forget we never forget right and something that has been planted in especially if it's if it's been discounted and it's been considered and it's been mulled over and then it's been discounted and it fires off again, then that person is more likely to go back to that original argument and look into it. So it might be months down the line. And that's why it's important for vegan activists to think, to not get too despondent and think, I... Um, you know, I'm not making any headway with these people. Everybody's just telling me to fuck off. Well, actually, I argue that those people who are most resistant at the time are the ones who have to work harder psychologically to discount your argument. And it's gone in. It's really gone in because they've had to work hard to discount it. And then further down the line, when they are more ready and more susceptible to considering veganism, then your argument is the thing that probably will swing it for them. So that's the sleeper effect, that there's, there's a discounting principle there, right? So ideas, things, people, you know, persuasion techniques that people have done, advertising campaigns, it all goes in, but it goes to sleep. That that's discounted has gone in, it's been mulled over, and it's there, and it's actually pretty strong, but it's just not at the surface. But then at a later date, it comes back to the fore. So that's the sleeper effect. Even when people are coming up to you and being pleasant about something, because we have these, we want to see ourselves as good people, I guess. Um, it's it's so easy to be very closed off and very defensive, even if they're being nice. So if you're going to go up to someone and 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 say something like. You know, if they, if they say, I'm trying to cut down on my meat consumption and you say to them, well, you're either vegan or you're an animal abuser. I mean, that's that's explicit. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but it seems like that's going to induce some, some uh, defensiveness. People can just think about how you would feel if you were on the, the you know, on the receiving mm -hmm. end of that kind of communication. We, we all know what it feels like to be shamed. 
We all know because we live in a world that is so profoundly relationally dysfunctional that shaming is like is normal. And, mm. you know, it's so normal as to be unremarkable. Nevertheless, it's counterproductive when you actually want somebody to change. You know, we people are we are all so defensive against feeling shame shame is an incredibly debilitating painful emotion and uh, and it is something that most of us carry around quite a bit of because we live in such a dysfunctional world where mm -hmm. we have been exposed to shaming uh, attitudes and behaviors you know since since we were born essentially um when we shame people you know or when we feel shamed or the threat of shame we wrap ourselves in the emotional armor to protect ourselves from being further shamed. We do mm. not open our hearts and minds. We withdraw or attack in self-defense. And I am not talking about not holding people accountable for problematic behaviors or for trying, you know, I'm not suggesting that we not try to change the system and to change the world. We obviously need to do that. And I believe that those of us who really care about this issue have a responsibility to be open to how we can work toward change in the most effective way possible. I think most vegans would agree that if someone said, I've been trying to cut back on my meat consumption, saying, well, you're either a vegan or an animal abuser, would be a socially incompetent response. I would probably respond with, hey, that's great. What inspired you to do that? And then let the conversation flow from there, but guiding them towards veganism. I think what's important is not so much the words we use, but how we use them. People want to make certain words off limits, like holocaust, murder, or corpse, apparently. But it's so contextual. I generally avoid using these words, but if they're used in the right context, I think they can be highly effective. Like, here's an anecdote. Years ago, I was talking with my mom, who at the time was sympathetic to veganism and tried to eat mostly plant-based. But she loved half and half in her coffee and couldn't give it up. She also said that if she were cooking for herself, it would be plant-based, but she had to cook for my brothers and didn't want to deal with them complaining. I remember saying something like, you're in control, you buy the groceries. If they complain, they can get over it. And then she got upset and started crying, and then I started crying and told her she was supporting the Holocaust. A few months later, she was vegan. I think a lot of people are conflict averse, so they avoid touchy subjects like religion or politics. But my siblings and I would relentlessly talk about these things with our parents. And yes, it caused some turmoil. But now, neither of my parents are religious, and they're both Bernie supporters, so... Melanie says she's not saying that we shouldn't hold people accountable for problematic behavior. But this contradicts what she said earlier. Asking people to become vegan allies rather than to go vegan is not holding them accountable. Telling people they're part of the solution when they're still part of the problem is not holding them accountable. Validating people's excuses is not holding them accountable. I feel like we keep rehashing this shit over and over again. This rhetoric that we should be promoting reducitarianism instead of veganism is sold to us as the most effective way to advocate for animals. But such claims are based on limited and dubious evidence. No other successful social justice movement has adopted this approach. Imagine a group dedicated to educating students about consent. How bizarre would it be for them to advocate for less rape instead of no rape? From the article, reducing is a good thing, reducing animals to food is not. Reducitarianism is a speciesist approach. It condones and validates harm to individuals and doesn't advocate giving them serious consideration as moral subjects. And when we ask somebody to change behaviors or we're highlighting problematic behaviors, we really need to do that in a way that honors their dignity. What is equally important is that we communicate in a way that honors the dignity of the victims. And I don't think Melanie is doing that by watering down the message. Thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment down below if you would also love to see Melanie and Michelle debate each other. All right, peace out. Yo, how when me eat them, I wonder when me eat When me tell them, say me not eat no fish, no, no me now How when me eat them, I wonder when me yam When me tell them, say that I'm a vegan man How when me eat them, I wonder when me eat